Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. Today we will start our show with the global economy. Last week, the head of the IMF said economic growth led by China and the U.S. is accelerating, amplifying the risks of an uneven global recovery. And earlier, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development said it expected the global economy to expand by 4.7 percent this year, but warned that pre-existing conditions have worsened, which could dampen the outlook. So with the pandemic still casting its shadow on most of the world, what policies can spur economic recovery? Let's loop in our panelists. In Washington, D.C., we're joined by William Lee, chief economist with the Milken Institute in Shenzhen, Xiao Gong, professor of Peking University HSBC Business School. In Shanghai, last but not least, Qian Jun, executive dean of the Fan Hai International School of Finance with Fudan University. Gentlemen, what a pleasure to have all of you on the program. Let me start by asking who will lead the recovery of uh, the economy worldwide. Now we are still struggling with COVID-19. Uh, Professor Qian, your take. We've been seeing uh, in the last few months, China obviously uh, remained the only large economy in the world that recorded a positive growth rate for, for year 2020. Uh, so the recovery trend is continuous. But obviously in the last two months, uh, focus has switched to the US uh, which uh, speed up the uh, process of vaccination, but also the Biden administration rolled out this uh, 1.9 trillion fiscal stimulus. Uh, and, uh, you know, we expect that the U.S. growth rate to hit over 5%. That will be the highest since 1984. But at the same time, people start to worry about mm. inflation. Uh, but we can comment about that later. So at the yeah. moment, I think the U.S. is the focus. Is the U.S. the one? Uh, Mr. Lee, your thoughts? Well, the U.S. Uh, just now uh, it's starting to kick back into normality again. But in terms of leading the uh, global economy, our huge demand for imports from China, both in terms of uh, electronic equipment, consumer goods, as well as medical supplies, has been a, a major force, essentially uh, being a locomotive, driving a lot of China's production. So in some sense, the U.S. was already leading China when China was recovering. And thank God China was recovering because it was able to supply the import needs of the United States. But now as we come back online again, I think the U.S. and China both will be locomotives for the global economy if China can change its dual circulation strategy sufficiently so that it is not just inward focused, but rather also inclusive of the global economy as well. The dual circulation, uh, that has been a very special phrase uh, invented by China. Mainly it's about China open to the rest of the world's economy, but at the same time, it can also afford an internal circulation. Now, there are accusations. Um, what is your opinion about the durability of this dual economy, Professor Chen? My own take is that <clears throat> both are very important. Now, the fact that the domestic circulation came first, maybe you need to take that into context by the timing of, of this phrase. It was in the middle of last year where, uh, you know, basically the global economy was still in shutdown mode. Right. Uh, China uh, uh, was leading the, the recovery because uh, China contained the virus first. Uh, and also, uh, as Professor Xiao mentioned, that China faced a lot of backlash. Uh, mostly from the U.S., from uh, the European countries. In that kind of framework, in that kind of environment, uh, I, I think it's understandable they, they put the uh, domestic uh, circulation first. I mean, I, you know, I teach finance. You, you, deal, with, uh, you deal with risk. And, and in, a, in a world of risk and uncertainty, domestic circulation can be regarded as an insurance policy for China because, you know, we, we have large enough yeah. markets. But I, I actually look at the, the second part equally important, uh, you know, as witnessed by the fact that RCEP was, uh, was uh, uh, agreed upon uh, by right. the end of the year. Uh, China is still very actively uh, engaged in global trade. Uh, it's just that there are some uh, subtle, maybe not so subtle shifts in terms of, you know, for example, at the end of last year, if you look at export plus import, the biggest trading partner uh, with China, 
uh, was not U.S., was not uh, Europe, but uh, ASEAN uh, uh, countries. Right. But at the same time, uh, U.S., Europe, Japan, and Korea remain very important trading partners with China. I, I, I don't, I don't see a a, a scenario where China is going to shut down its door. Well, the door circulation is actually uh, something which every country has been doing. And for China to highlight this is really in response to the U.S., uh, you know, a very aggressive, uh, you know, uh, actions, you know, towards uh, the, the decoupling. Yeah. What exactly is China doing right now uh, in order to make sure its own economy will do well, while at the same time be able to, to a certain extent at least, rally the crowd into a better economy worldwide, Professor Xiao? What China has been doing uh, is not appreciated enough. Uh, uh, for example, in terms of the supply, uh, China's supply capacity and the actual exports, uh, particularly uh, in uh, fighting with uh, COVID-19 and also climate change, you know, all the things that China is doing is really uh, something uh, we undervalued. Uh, First, to stabilize its own economy, and that's already very successful. But at the same time, it's contributing, uh, you know, really uh, uh, to helping not just uh, uh, the developing country, but also the U.S. economy. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the U.S. government printed so much money, yeah. but they need to buy things, you know. And China is supporting, uh, you know, supplying those and keep the price low. But that's very crucial. I agree with uh, Professor Xiao that China is very important in terms of stabilizing uh, the global economy. <clears throat> you know, people are very concerned that, that the U.S. has uh, released so much liquidity, printed so much money, uh, the, the fiscal stimulus, yeah. you know, there was one, wrong one last year. We, we're seeing the 1.9 trillion being rolled out. There's also discussion about the two trillion <clears throat> or more uh, fiscal stimulus in the coming months. The the point is that as long as the dollar remains the only only reserve currency for the world, actually it's the global community, the global markets are bearing the uh, risk, including inflation risk, yes. uh, coming from the uh, U.S. government. We've already seen uh, some countries like Turkey. Uh, that's not doing well uh, in, in recent months because of the so-called dollar cycle. And again, in this regard, China being a very large economy, as long as China is growing, as long as China's financial markets, on, which are also very important, mm -hmm. as long as China's financial markets are still in stable conditions, mm -hmm. it's actually a very important cushion uh, in terms of uh, making sure the global financial system yeah. remains in stable condition. Okay, Mr. Di, you come in, please. Well, the global liquidity, I think, is there as, a, as the reserve currencies to ensure that all financial markets around the world are able to do their job, which is to funnel money from where savers have it to where it has to be spent. It, it is from the U.S. that, that we ensure that the global financial system, both bond markets, capital markets, banking systems, and stock markets mm. have sufficient liquidity with, so that people can invest without a fear of interest rates uh, rising, the real interest rates rising beyond uh, some level that will choke off investment. Right. So, so I think one of the things that the Federal Reserve has tried to do is act as a global central bank and to ensure that dollar liquidity uh, is, is, is sufficiently available to whoever wants it. Now, clearly in China, if you have the investments to do, you're gonna use renminbi and, 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 the, and the, the, the central bank in, in China has that responsibility for its domestic posture. But because of the global nature of the dollar, I think one of the things that the United States has done uh, has to prevent any thought of a dollar shortage. We should get too carried away with is the prospect of inflation that is beyond a normal level of say 2% around the world. Certain economies surely have done badly, such as Turkey, uh, because of bad domestic policy. Turkey has been a basket case for as long as I've been a professional economist. And when I was at the IMF, Turkey was always on our list of countries with a tremendous balance of payments problems. So, so, so aside from the, the bad uh, domestic policies that, that distort a, an economy, uh, I think the, the key is to ensure the sufficient global liquidity to keep finance the spending that's needed to be spent in order to shift the economy back to a normal posture again. 
Well, that has a lot to do with the dollar issue. Uh, Professor Xiao, you know better than I do as an economist. So what about that dollar issue? This is actually the key question. Uh, the U.S., uh, uh, of course, with dollar as the global currency, has some uh, exorbitant, uh, you know, privilege. Uh, uh, and that's fine, you know, for so many years. The liquidity part, I think, uh, is important to stabilize the global financial system. And the, the fiscal deficit part is also important in stabilize the U.S. economy. So in that sense, I think the whole, uh, the world community should support the U.S. Uh, but the problem is uh, the U.S. fiscal deficit uh, is not really sustainable. And the, what it really means is the global community are subsidizing uh, the U.S. government. Uh, uh, but the, the, this, in the short run, I think is necessary because otherwise the global economy will collapse, right? But geopolitically, I think uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, authority and also the U.S. people should recognize. You know, this this is something uh, which uh, the rest of the world is contributing to uh, the stabilization of the U.S. Mm -hmm. and the U.S. should take this opportunity not just to stabilize its economy, but also contribute to the stability of the global economy and the, also, you know, the geopolitical stability. Uh, so that's some part I think China uh, is not really very happy. You know, we are helping so much uh, uh, in terms of supporting the U.S. dollar, in terms of supporting the U.S. economy and the U.S. people, you know, the living states. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, a lot of politicians are really taking China as uh, like a rivalry uh, and uh, creating a lot of really troubling uh, geopolitical conflicts. I see. Don't forget, back in the 60s, when the global economy was growing very rapidly, there was the so-called dollar shortage problem. There wasn't sufficient amount of liquidity out there to finance the growth that was going on. And now as the economy is coming back on track again, not just the, the Federal Reserve, but also the ECB uh, has ensured that there's sufficient liquidity. Going forward, I, I absolutely agree that the international uh, financial system needs restructuring. Uh, what will serve as uh, future vehicle currencies around the world. Uh, there's a notion of optimal currency areas that, that, that the world can be broken up into uh, trade zones and currency zones where the dominant currencies are no longer the U.S. dollar, but whatever is appropriate for the financial and trade flows within the region. I think the fear of the dollar remaining sort of the, the dominant exploitive currency that, that somehow is extracting resources from the rest of the world is a misnomer and, and not an accurate uh, image of really the actual e-trade and, and commercial transactions around the world. And I think in about five years or 10 years, we're not we're gonna see a multitude of currencies, a multitude of, 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 of non-national currencies that are being used um, in a medium of exchange that, that will be much more direct from consumer to uh, producer. Mm. Professor Xiao, can we look at 10 years from now already, or it is mainly the big issue that we are facing right now? The key is what the U.S. will do. Uh, U.S., uh, if cooperated with China and the rest of the world, it, it can remain uh, uh, dollar as an important reserve currency, and if not, the dollar could, could collapse. I agree with uh, uh, Mr. Lee to the extent that in times of uncertainty, in times of global uncertainty, we need enough what we call safe assets uh, to cushion uh, the need for transactions, right? The issue is to what extent can the U.S. dollar fill that role by itself? Uh, you know, this is not 50 years ago. So, so if you look at the size of the U.S. economy, if you look at the size of the U.S. financial markets relative to the global size, it cannot, it cannot single-handedly provide enough liquidity for the entire world. That's the issue. So in times of new crisis or uncertainty, there needs to be a global coordination in terms of how much liquidity there needs. Mm. That's one. And two, as I said, absolutely, the dollar remains the number one uh, reserve currency. Dollar assets are, are still considered very safe. As long as the debt level uh, remain uh, sustainable, as Professor Xiao warns, but the point is that there, there definitely needs to be more voices. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, you know, if, you look at the, if you look at the euro, the euro was used almost as much as the dollar 
uh, in the SWIFT system for the global uh, transactions last year. And that reflects the global investors on ease with the status of the dollar. But the fact that you haven't seen a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, inflation, for example, in the U.S., one of the reasons is, is precisely because of trade. And, and then you basically uh, 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 take advantage of all the economies and, and products and services produced in China are produced very efficiently and that help maintain the price level in the US. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, we, we need to talk about this because uh, especially in, in the middle of the pandemic, geopolitical issues uh, are in the center of global economic recovery and, and people need to uh, understand more of each country's contribution to the global economy and not mm -hmm. just blame others uh, uh, for, for the misfortune. Mr. Lee, for you, uh, what about the U.S. economy? 1.9 trillion U.S. dollars for the relief package, and then there's huge likely also a package for infrastructure. There's a tax raises for corporations. What does that mean hmm. for the U.S. economy? Well, in some ways, what you just outlined in, in President Biden's infrastructure plan is uh, our mini version of our deal circulation strategy, which is to, over a 10-year period, to spend that $3 trillion to, or actually $2.2 .2 trillion yes. to try to improve the infrastructure, which has been declining so rapidly in the United States and to, to bring it back up to at least the 20th century standards as, as in even maybe approach 21st century. So that, that in that sense, uh, the United States is acting the same way China did, which is to use a lot of public spending to boost aggregate demand at a time when uh, the, the virus was threatened to shut down the private sector. So, so these macro policies, short-term policies, are, are, are to be called for and, and, and appropriate. I think from a, a U.S. perspective, when I hear about the deal circulation strategy, it, it's a one statement in a line of many statements over a series of five-year plans that where China is directing its industries to become at the frontier and, and to dominate the, the technologically advanced technology industries like uh, chip making, artificial intelligence, uh, pharmaceuticals, and, and, and to, to China's credit, it should be doing that because France has done that, uh, Singapore has done that. And the Every U.S. has been doing it recently with years. the industrial policies also. It, it is exactly. Industrial policy means that you want to focus your resources in a way that develops national champions that can be global competitors. And so my concern for China is that uh, Shenzhen developed to be a powerhouse that it is because it learned that innovative tricks of Hong Kong back in the 70s and 80s that allowed Hong Kong to develop into a financial center. Uh, it failed in a lot of things and it re you know, restarted a lot. There are a lot of false starts in, in the innovation road. And I think um, if China wants to direct it to the needs of the center, um, those failures are not going to be there because of the fear of, re of, of retaliation from the center okay. if you don't do the right thing. And that immediately shrinks the possibilities of innovation. Uh, Mr. Chen, uh it's very interesting that uh, it is the United States, first of all, to link innovation with national security. And we see that scrutiny uh, that's happening every day, sometimes a little bit out of proportion. But certainly with the atmosphere we're seeing right now, so economists uh, will have to you know, face the reality and sometimes may not necessarily feel the same way, for example, like Mr. Li, who is a very liberal-minded uh, with uh, many of the economists uh, in China. So, uh, Mr. Chen, tell me more about your thoughts uh, toward this. This issue about what's the best practice of policy toward an innovation. Uh, uh, so, again, uh, as a financial economist, if you look at if you look at what uh, the U.S. has done, if you look at what other countries have done, I would ar I would argue that both markets orientation, building the markets, let the markets pick the winners is very important. And actually, China has done that. Uh, if you look at the city of Shenzhen, uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the enterprises, very successful enterprises, grew up in Shenzhen vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis market force. But I, I think at the same time, markets are not uh, cure-all. Uh, we do see market failures. Um, f financial markets have bubbles. Uh, uh, bubbles are very uh, dangerous uh, episodes and you need uh, intervention. You know, that's one example. The other example is for very long strategic development of new industries, 
uh, you know, financing these new industries, only relying on the market, especially markets that are not as developed and deep as the U.S. If you look at the world, the U.S. has uh, arguably the deepest and most developed markets, something that even Japan or Germany never had. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. has Silicon Valley. No one else had that. So for a lot of other countries, if your markets cannot do what the U.S. markets do, something else has to step in. All right. And, and uh, the, U the, the government's planning and monitoring and investment is, is one alternative. Okay. Whether that's the best alternative, uh, I, I guess uh, we, 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 can, we can do more uh, empirical tests to, 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 to figure out. But uh, so my view is that, you know, this planning, uh, the five-year or 10-year planning on China has been overall successful for China, uh, in part because if you look at the if you look at the okay. path for China's growth, we basically finished industrialization much quicker than other countries. And in this uh, strategy, in this past, this idea of planning, of focusing on some industries, mm -hmm. uh, has been uh, helpful. So at the end of the day, as a as a as a U.S. trained economist and someone spent a lot of years in the U.S. Uh, I do see the power of markets, but I also see that markets cannot solve all the problems. You know, when it comes to the governance, there's a, so much debate, but that's another debate. We might be able to invite all of you to participate in the next time around. But for now, I want to thank every one of you for contributing tremendously. I'm from the bottom of your heart in this discussion. William Lee, Xiao Geng, Qian Jun, you guys are making this conversation uh, really exhilarating. Thank you so much.